Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Grung. I'm Masbet Bedrosyan. In this Conversations on Grung episode, we'll be talking about the earthquake readiness of Armenia after the recent shake near Yerevan. This episode was recorded on Friday, January 19, 2021. On Saturday, February 13, a magnitude 4.7 earthquake hit Armenia 8 kilometers southeast of Yerevan. No deaths or serious injuries were reported. We're all thankful for that, of course, but the 1988 earthquake will always have us asking questions about safety and preparedness. For that, we have with us Dr. Armender Gurerian, who is a structural and civil engineering professor at UC Berkeley with research focus on earthquake engineering. He is a co-founder and was president of the American University of Armenia from 2014 until 2019. Hello and welcome, Professor. Hello, Aspet. I'm glad to be here. According to the Ministry of Emergency Situations Seismic Protection Service Chief Sos Markarian, this earthquake was on the Yerevan fault line. What do we know about this fault line or the region in general? Well, Armenia is located at the meeting point of several tectonic plates, Eurasian plate, the Arabian plate, the Iranian plate, the Anatolian plate, in a way mimicking the political situation where Armenia has been in the junction of several big uh, powers in history. And so earthquakes can happen in these faults. Uh, This particular fault, my understanding, is not a major fault, but it's there and there are many other faults. There's one in Gardenid, somewhat more uh, important fault. So uh, there, there are faults, and these earthquakes uh, can happen in Armenia almost anywhere. I was asking because some social media sites were advancing rumors that the earthquake was caused by other than natural causes, maybe biological or other weapons, who knows. So Smargarian flatly dismissed such possibilities. Well, it's interesting. Uh, right after the 1988 earthquake, the same rumors spread that the Soviet Union and Russians had a big depot of weapons that exploded. No such thing. We brought recordings of uh, the ground motion to Berkeley Seismographic Station, and we examined it, and clearly this was earthquake. An earthquake and explosions would have very different recordings. I'm pretty sure this is an earthquake, genuine earthquake. Have building and construction codes and standards improved since the big one in 1988? Well, yes, in several ways. First, uh, in 1988, the zoning was such that uh, a rather low intensity was considered. They call it ball 7, 8 was the level at which buildings were designed, depending where they were located. Mm -hmm. And after that, they changed because 1988 earthquake had an intensity far greater than what was anticipated in the building code, Soviet building codes then. So yes, first, the design level has been increased. Second, in the 1988, uh, many, many of the buildings that collapsed, in fact, or heavily damaged, were particular designs. Uh, One series was called 111 series designs. These were prefabricated beam columns, panels that were connected on site and the connections typically were very poorly done, and there was no strong tying together the buildings. And as a result, these buildings, uh, many of them collapsed or were severely damaged. That kind of construction is not happening anymore in Armenia. By the way, there were also these lift slab buildings in Kumri that one of them collapsed, the other one had to be demolished. Uh, That kind of building also has stopped. Uh, They don't design or construct that kind of building. However, in Armenia, including Yerevan, there are many, many hundreds of buildings of that type or or similar types. The new construction is cast in place concrete, typically, and a lot better from observations that I have made, at least the ones that I've seen built by engineers from abroad have been fairly good and number of buildings have been built that are base isolated again fairly good quality but the problem is that there are hundreds and hundreds of buildings from these old designs that are still existing occupied in Yerman and they are the ones that are very vulnerable you mentioned hundreds and hundreds of buildings at risk 
Would the wide-scale retrofitting initiative be appropriate to consider, or are there other alternatives? Some of these buildings have been retrofitted, very few. Uh, in Vanazor, for example, I know two, three of them have been retrofitted. It is not easy to retrofit these buildings, and the cost would be enormous. I think in many cases, the better option would be to demolish and build new. But if you plan on retrofitting, these are already 30, 40, 50 year old buildings. If you want to retrofit them, strengthen them, the cost would be enormous. So I, I think the better option is gradually demolish and build new buildings. So we're talking about billions and billions of dollars here, right? Yes, yes, because there are hundreds of them. I realize that as a researcher and engineer, you may not be the right person to ask this, but do you know how well contractors comply with regulatory requirements and what consequences apply for non-compliance? I cannot say that I am. Um, to really be aware, you have to be involved in it very closely. I have not, I've lived in Armenia five years, but I have not been involved in that kind of work. It's very unfortunate that actually inspection of construction, inspection of buildings is a kind of activity that easily can be corrupted. And while I cannot say that that is happening now, I cannot say that it is not happening. I have seen uh, buildings that were done quite well, uh, very clean construction, uh, quality construction, but I've also seen from outside buildings that I would question their quality. In 1991, when I was there, people showed me broken pavements, stairwells, and other construction that they said was due to poorly manufactured cement because contractors stole from the material. So I became aware of the level of corruption in that segment of the industry. That's true. Uh, you could see in, uh, in Gumbri when we inspected, 10 days after the earthquake, we were there, the quality of concrete was quite poor. You could see that probably there was insufficient cement. You know, at that time, it was very difficult to get hold of cement. So people would uh, take cement from construction sites for their own dachas. So there were other problems as well. For example, it is not a good idea to have gravel that has uh, volcanic rock. It chemically doesn't work well with the cement, but most importantly, it was the poor quality of connections between columns and beams and panels. And, you know, these connections are critical areas for uh, earthquake resistant design. And those were extremely poorly done in those buildings that we saw. And I suspect uh, the same is true with many existing buildings in other in Yerevan and other cities. These go mostly from the period of Brezhnev and afterwards when the Soviet Union corruption and, and uh, lack of essential uh, items uh, became very difficult to manage. And so there was a lot of corruption, a lot mm -hmm. of stealing. Uh, so particularly, it's, it's interesting that the quality of the buildings depended on the uh, on the political history as well. For example, some buildings, although I must say not tall buildings, but one, two, three-story buildings from Stalin's period survive because nobody dared to, to steal. Right. Uh, so given all this, would you say Armenia is ready for the big one? Unfortunately, I cannot say that, no. Of course, Yerevan, I don't know if Yerevan is subject to a big earthquake like Gyumri was. Uh, the default that caused the Gyumri earthquake ran close to Spitak and then Malban village. Uh, that's fairly far from Yerevan. Near Yerevan, there are faults. The one that uh, this recent earthquake happened, Yerevan fault. And, but then also in Karni, there are faults. But to generate a big earthquake, you need to have a bigger fault, a rather long fault. I don't know exactly, but my guess is that in the near proximity of Yerevan, probably one would not expect as big an earthquake as the 1988 earthquake. But, I, I, you know, you never know. Yeah. Things are quite uncertain. 
Is there a government department, for example, the Ministry of Emergency Situations or whoever, that leads the country in disaster preparedness and performs routine drills? There, there is an organization, uh, seismic protection uh, organization, that uh, does this. In fact, when I was at the president of AUA, one year we had to have a drill for earthquake preparedness. And uh, so it was sort of an exercise we did. During the five years, that was one time we did that. In the US, uh, we are a lot better prepared. The government has developed, for example, uh, documents, guidelines on what to do for different uh, organizations. For example, what hospitals should do to be prepared before an earthquake and what actions they to, should take after an earthquake, what police stations should do, what schools should do, what uh, government buildings should do. I don't think in Armenia the preparedness is as extensive and well-developed as here, but there is an institution. And unfortunately, some of what they are doing is uh, not really relevant. For example, they are putting a lot of effort into predicting earthquakes. I remember once I visited at Institute and they had big tanks, fish swimming in the tank because they believe from the behavior of the fish they can hmm. predict earthquakes. Listen, a lot of people have tried. Earthquake prediction is not uh, something that uh, will prove to be useful in saving lives. Right. Well, how much lead time can you give to a population of millions to make earthquake prediction a useful tool? Well, China, once they were able to predict an earthquake a couple of days before, a day or so before, so they asked the population to stay outside, and indeed there was an earthquake, and so probably they saved lots of lives. Uh, but then that was one success out of many failures. Mm -hmm. It is, if you can monitor many, many things, uh, water levels in wells and small movements on faults and you know but, but that is just incredibly difficult to do yeah. it is possible yeah. to do early warning matter of 10 seconds or so 10 20 seconds they use these kinds of techniques to for example in japan to slow down the bullet train yeah this is possible but to predict uh, well in advance so that people can plan for it go outside the buildings and so on I, I don't think it is something that you can hang your hat on or rely on on it for safety of buildings. I think it would be better to put the emphasis on retrofitting the existing buildings or strengthening the existing building or better building new ones. I was hoping you would say that there's something in Armenia that's equivalent to the big shakeout, California's annual statewide earthquake preparedness drill. All students across the state would rehearse the duck cover and hold practice. People would learn to prepare and maintain their emergency or first response kits and know where they are kept. And on an institutional level, we all prepared our campuses detailed to the buildings and floor by floor, assigning and drilling people in their disaster response and recovery roles, rehearsing business continuity procedures and so well, on. Well, California is unique aspect. We have so many earthquakes here. We feel it in San Francisco. We feel this year or last year we felt five or six small earthquakes. So it keeps you on your toes. You are better prepared. In Armenia, I think people are, they don't think of it. And I should not say Armenia alone. Most countries, they don't think about it until it happens. Can they focus on it and develop a program? I think it, the cost would not be very much to organize particularly for schools, for hospitals, for uh, government buildings to organize events where they learn what to do in case of an earthquake and, you know, th th things, very simple things. For example, bookshelves should be connected to the walls. They, right. they, these bookshelves or heavy standing, tall standing equipment, these things could be killing people in the case of an earthquake, just by falling on, on their heads. And fixing these things is very little. Is it done in Armenia? I, in most places, probably not. So a campaign like this would be useful if it can be initiated. Mm -hmm. But one understands that at this time, people in Armenia are in a different 
train of thought that they, they are really in a different mood, but uh, sooner or later, one can focus on these things at not much cost, but at least be prepared and do some basic things that can save lives and uh, reduce the amount of loss. Okay. So as a closing question, are there questions that I should be asking and are there conversations that are not happening that really should be happening? I think the, in terms of seismic risk, the fundamental issue is what do we do with all those uh, buildings, Series 111 and others, Hanelain, and, and there were, you know, uh, an interesting thing, because this was Soviet Union, rather than having a unique design for each building, you had one design and it was repeated time and time. So you had hundreds of buildings that were essentially the same design. Mm -hmm. And so if you find solution for one, you can apply it to many, many. But I think what is missing right now is a serious talk of what do we do with all those buildings, existing buildings that are 30, 40, 50 year old, which are vulnerable. And I think my guess is the best solution is gradually demolish them and build new ones. That would be because I think retrofitting those would be extremely costly and also technically difficult. These are typically eight, 10, 12 story buildings and to retrofit a building like this, to build a shear wall that will uh, provide lateral strength would be extremely difficult. So I think that conversation is not happening. Well, okay. Much to talk about. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Dergurerian. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Aspect. Good luck. That concludes this conversation's ongoing episode. We hope it was helpful in your understanding of some of the issues involved. We look forward to your feedback, including your suggestions for conversation topics in the future. Contact us on our website at grong.org or on our Facebook page, ann-grung, or in our Facebook group, Grung-Armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels, like our pages, and follow us on social media. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.